You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central. It is 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Do you know what's going on in the world of futures options? Well, that's our job to all find out together, shall we? Because it is time once again for TWIFO this week in futures options. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which all of you are just chugging down the bandwidth. Hope it's tasty. We tend to think so, but hey, we might be biased out there. 17 years on, I guess we're putting out something some folks must like. <laughs> Remember, if you like it, throw a rating, a star, a comment. It does help new people continue to discover these ever-evolving markets out there. And if you want to discover a little bit of additional content in your lives, maybe you want to win some awesome prizes, today's Leap Day. Happy Leap Day, listen. It means tomorrow we'll have to give away the Pro Trading Crate for the month of February. So crazy time. Remember, these crates are just flying out the door. If you want to get your hands on those, you want to join us for options oddities after volatility views, you want to get awesome pro Q&As like the one we just did yesterday over there on the old pro Q&A hot seat, then only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go to learn more. As we learn who's joining me today on the old CME group hot seat, Today, I am pleased to welcome back our old friend, Mr. Dan Gramza from Gramza Capital Management. Happy Leap Day to you, sir. Well, thank you, Mark. Very same to you. Hope all goes well. How do you celebrate Leap Day in the Gramza household? Is it a big festival, a big party? No, I hadn't really thought about it that much, actually, but it is unique. Every four years, you know, a lot of people feel it has an impact on the markets and some statistics have shown since 1950 that a leap year day like today has a 65% probability of being an up day. How about that? Oh, there we go. Every data point 
can be backed into some sort of market statistic at the end of the day, right? Super Bowl, I think you're Leap right. Day, <laughs> uh, Light Beer, I don't care what it is. They all can back into whether the market should be up or down someday. I love it. Let's see what else there is to love, listeners, as we keep on rolling right on into the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's commence with the Movers and Shakers. What's lighting it up to the light side and to the dark side over there at CME Group this week, both from an underlying movement and from a vol perspective over there at CME this week. All right, Mr. Dan... The newly improved Movers and Shakers report, sir. Where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side or to the dark side? Or maybe you want to start with Vol or first. To the I'll, light I'll, side. I'll let you choose. We can start with Vol first if you want as well. We'll mix it all up. It's leap day. Ooh, Why not? Ooh, let's do Vol. Okay, Vol. Which way should we start? Light side or dark side to the Vol? Sir? Light side. All right. Let's start with Vol first. Listeners, to the light side we go. This is one. If you go look for it over there at seemegroup.com slash cvol. You can find the Siva. I'm not sure if you're able to do the ordered functionality the way we are, but I'll have to play around with the free tool, see what you guys can do. But at the very least, you can see the Siva numbers that we're talking about. Remember, this is the methodology. It's analogous to what SIBO uses in terms of at the money vol with a little bit of skew thrown in there as well. And you get a Siva number that they throw out at you. All right, to the dark side we go. Number five to the dark side. We're starting in the metals, but not the shiny stuff. We're going to aluminum as the brits say 16 and a half is the sea ball out there off 2.16 percent again these numbers are not going to line up exactly with at the money 30 day ball but it's going to be roughly in that ballpark to give you some sense of what we're talking about here then we're going out to the rates it's the five year listeners uh 141 and a half off two and a half points now that one that's a little juicy for five year ball so <laughs> triple digits out there same thing with the treasury like they do these aggregate sea balls, and now when you're talking aggregates, obviously the number is not going to reflect much of anything. A 128.87 is the aggregate treasury sea ball. Ball also coming off there across the board on the treasury side, off a little over three, about 3.05 points. Number two, we're getting close to the beginning of the curve. That's where Uncle Mike hung out last week. The two-year, that's at a 155.62. Remember, if you listen to that show. A two-year vol is nowhere near 155%, so that's, a, that's an interesting number, 155 for the two-year treasury. Nonetheless, that is off a little over three, about 3.09 points. And the number one dark side mover on the vol side this week is actually the 10-year, the place where a lot of you like to hang out on the yield curve. A 123.48 is that number off about three and a half, actually about 3.6 points on the week. All right, to the light side we go now. Number five to the light side it's off to the eggs. It's soybeans, 19.16, up about 0.42 on the week. Number four, it's feeder cattle. So from the eggs, we go into the livestock. That's at a 14.33, up a little over half, about 0.57 points on the week. Number three, our old friend Nat Gas sneaking in on the vol side this week. It's at 71.53. If you know anything about Nat Gas vol, it's been hanging out around the mid to low 60s, high 50s for a while. So 71, not that far removed. Uh, that's up about 0.68 on the week. Number three, the aggregate energy C ball. That's at a 52.68. That's up about almost three quarters of a point. And the number one light side ball mover this week is live cattle. That's at about a 12.57, up about 1.3 points. Uh, so that's interesting. A couple of livestock names on the ball movers and shakers this week. All right, to the underlying movers and shakers we go now. I'm going to pick this time, Dan, just for fun. I'm going to go off to the dark side first. Uh, because the number one light side mover, I think, is uh, is going to generate some conversation. Number one, or should I say number five to the dark side, it is heating oil off 1.85%. It was number three in the same direction last week off 2.74%. So not a great couple of weeks for heating oil. And number four, it's the New Zealand dollar off 1.85%. Don't see FX sneaking in there too often, which again is somewhat interesting. I'll have to pull that one up. I'm guessing not a ton of contracts lighting it up out there in the New Zealand dollar USD spread, but uh, you never know. Maybe this is the week for it. And then uh, number three, to the ags we go. In particular, we're going to Rough Rice listeners. Rough Rice this week off 1.85%. And then here I am looking for getting distracted by this New Zealand dollar. There we go. Uh, number two, it's platinum off two, about 2.5% two this week. And number one, keeping it in the metals, it is palladium. 
off 3.45%. Number four in the other direction last week, up 2.75%. I'm looking here for the New Zealand dollar. I don't see, unfortunately, a ton of paper. I got a little excited listeners. Maybe we could squeeze some FX onto the show this week. But alas, not exactly lighting the world on fire. All right, number five to the light side. Here we go, listeners. It is going off to the ags. It is corn up 2.33%, followed by number four, back to the rates. It is the ultra 30-year, up 3.27%. Number three, it is lumber, up 4.34%. Number two, back to the oats, back to the ags, I should say. This time it's oats, not unfortunately. Another one doesn't do a ton of options paper, up 5.2%. It was number one in the other direction last week, off 7.39%. We probably have to add oats back in or i should say really have it replace lumber on our movers and shakers because it's uh it's crazy and then number one speaking of crazy dan bitcoin up 19.1 percent on the week you know the volume has been a bit of a disappointment out there but the underlying is so just crazy these days and so controversial north of 60k now listeners 61,700 when we kicked off the show so i think dan The people demand it. We have to start in crypto this week. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, listeners, to the wild world of crypto. Have you been along for this crazy ride? Not just in Bitcoin, but in ETH and in Solana and just about every other crypto asset out there these days. Just rocking and rolling out there. If you want to see what's rocking and rolling on CME on the crypto front for yourselves, head on over to cmegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. And then you're going to go into that asset class drop down. Crypto is pretty easy to find. It's just the second down from the top. It is an alpha order list after all. And once you're there, you have a bunch of choices. You have big Ether and Bitcoin. Those are the large multipliers. 5X on Bitcoin. I believe it's 50X on Ether, which is a beast of a contract or the micro obviously the much smaller size contract the bite size micro bitcoin and micro ether as i mentioned flirting with 62,000 out there 61,785 as we're kicking off the show so let's just start there dan uh bitcoin it's been a beast to watch for the last few months how much interest are your viewers how much are they how much requests are you getting for analysis of crypto, analysis of Bitcoin out there right now? And then what are your thoughts on what we're seeing out there, this crazy move? Well, actually, excuse me. See, it chokes me up just thinking about it. (laughs) Breaks you up. It it is a very interesting market. And I do have a lot of people asking about it. And I think if you look at how this rally has occurred, starting down there around 40,000 back about the latter part of January, we've seen some consistent behavior that that typical – rally, rest, or imbalance to balance. That kind of movement, it's its giving us that type of movement. What's also been interesting is if you look at a trend line below the lows on that chart, what you'll see is the angle of that trend line continues to increase in every new up leg. So we started out walking around 10% if you look at that angle. And then we went to around 60%. And that's what we saw in February, earlier part of February. That implies the market's jogging. And if you look at an angle of a trend, of a move, between 45 and 70%, those are fairly sustainable. And it's usually what you see in a strong trend. However, What we've seen here lately, and I mean lately over just the last few days, we've started to almost go vertical. And that is where you don't want to see a market moving, actually, because that's the market sprinting. And it's very difficult to maintain that type of momentum. So what you'll typically see as you see that kind of move is a market that starts getting toppy. The the thing from my point of view, 
in a vertical market, like we're seeing here in Bitcoin, is you want a relatively tight stop. In other words, when the market was jogging, and let's that's that 60 to 70 percent range, let's say, there you can give it kind of a loose stop because it implies sustainability. When you go vertical, you want kind of a tight stop because it can easily come down as fast as it went up. I mean, if you look at yesterday's action, which I find you know, really interesting in this market, and it was a great example of a vertical move, uh, <clears throat> even though it can be a big move, it's very difficult to maintain it. The high was $64,990, all right? That was the high as it got up there, but it closed around 57,350, so it really backed off that high. That's what we saw yesterday. If you look at the previous days in this move, we closed basically near the high. In this case, we backed off quite a bit from that high. So it got high enough to find what? From my point of view, they found sellers. And what that implies then is that buyers selling to take profits? Is it a market that has gotten high enough that people say, this is out of whack and new sellers come into the market? If it's new sellers coming into the market, today and tomorrow should be down days. If it's buyers selling to take profits, then that means today would basically be an inside type day. Now, what we've seen so far for today is an inside type day, which implies that it's possibly in that rest phase. Although we rallied above 64,000 today, we're trading around 61,000, almost 62,000 right now. So it backed off. So is there, the reason I look at that is that I think that close compared to that high is a measure of confidence. It's a measure of comfort. Those buyers, are they willing to hold on to it going into the close? Well, they didn't yesterday. And today we still have a ways to go, but so far they backed off as well. So that would imply for Friday <clears throat> that we'd look for an inside type day. The other thing, Mark, that really I find interesting with this kind of structure is let's say tomorrow we have another inside day. And let's say Monday we start testing those highs again. We get back up towards that, oh, 65,000 range. If we trade above that 65,000, you want it to be explosive. You want it to close near 67,000, 68,000. You want it to be dramatic because that implies continuation, that buyers have come in with both hands and they're willing to hold on to it. If on the other hand, we make another big dramatic high, or I should say maybe not a big dramatic high, let's do that. We come up and we kiss 66,000. So it made a new high, barely. Not a good sign for a continuation. It implies the paper or the, the volume just isn't there to support the market at that time. And it, it also implies the possibility of it getting toppy. And, you know, what causes a market to change direction? You know, from my point of view, if you think about what price does, Price promotes activity. It wants people to come in. As it starts going higher, people feel the train is leaving the station without them. So it advertises for buyers to come in. At the same time, it's always advertising for sellers. In other words, are we too far away from the perception of value? And if we are, that's when we start seeing those sellers coming into a market, and that could be a toppy type behavior. So it's really kind of a fascinating market right now. And you know, Mark, 
<clears throat> I think the other thing that has really stimulated activity in this market, and I could be wrong on this, obviously, but it, it's when they gave approval of the ETF on Bitcoin. When we saw that happening, it became an additional legitimate way to gain exposure. I mean, I think that's the power of a futures contract here on Bitcoin. I mean, I, I would not personally trade the cash market. Uh, it, there's just no controls on it. And if I have a problem, I got nobody to go to. You know, if I had a problem with the entity that I tried to make the transaction with, they say, I don't know, I'll see you in court. When it comes to the futures market, we have a way for conflict resolution. We have regulators in there. We have a an, a, an accepted marketplace that has these rules and regulations in it. So I think it gives us that comfort. The other side of the coin is that there are institutions out there, pension funds, for example, that cannot touch derivatives. So they can't touch futures. They can't touch options on futures, which they have for Bitcoin at the CME group. But they can touch derivative, I mean, uh, securities like ETFs. So it provides an outlet there. And I think the more people you bring to the party, the healthier it is for a market, whether it goes up or down. Healthier in that in terms of liquidity. And uh, we'll see that bleed over to the options, which really give a tremendous amount of choices, as you know. So I, I think Bitcoin is it's a bit uh, in rarefied atmosphere as it gets up here is what we're seeing. It'll be interesting to see if it's going to be sustainable. And one more thing, if that's true, that means by Wednesday of next week, we should be at that 67, 68,000. If we are not, then look for a sideways move. And when we've seen Bitcoin go into that balance phase, the sideways move, um, we've had two of them. If you look at the end of January, first part of February, it was about six days that we went sideways. If you look at the last one we had, which was about the middle of February, that one was also six days. So the market went imbalanced, it rallied, took a breath for six days, and then it rallied again. That's what we've seen twice since the latter part of January. So that's what you'd want to look for here. If we don't make new highs tomorrow, if we begin a sideways move, well, that would imply within the next six days to seven days, this thing should be heading higher. And if it's not, that would imply the possibility of a toppy market. So those are some of my thoughts about how this market seems to be evolving. Well done, as always, sir. Let's keep on rolling out here into the land of the Bitcoin options. Let's see what's lighting it up. I and mean, this is, again, a, a pivotal level north of 60K, threatening 62,000. It's shot up a bit since we've been talking, 61,965 <laughs> since we started this segment. So, yeah, the big movers out here. Is it translating into a big volume week? Well, I guess it kind of depends what you mean by big. If you're talking from a Bitcoin options perspective, then yeah, you're talking 5 to 10x the normal volume you see. Usually we see 200 something, maybe maybe 500 if it's if it's a crazy week out here. Uh 2100 pretty much on the tape right now. So that's actually a pretty active week. Again, it's no 10 year, it's no e mini. <laughs> it's not even a silver, but it's something. It I mean, again, a lot of people would be hoping for more, but uh, that's what we get. Uh, in terms of action, 75% of that's going up in the March contract. It has about 27, 28 days to go. We'll hang out out there. What is the vol right now in that March contract? At about a 66. So again, crypto delivering the only assets that can really kind of touch that gas right now from an overall vol perspective. And it's up about 12, almost 13 points this week. 
Uh, skew wise, no surprise. There's a bid to the upside. It was 4.1 percent bid last week, 3 percent bid this week. Again, we blown through so many strikes. Not surprising to see maybe some people taking some of those calls off the tape. Puts kind of negligible. They were flat last week and pretty much flat this week. Uh, in terms of action, it was the 70,000 calls leading the dance in March, going up 175 times this week. <laughs> uh, 92 times today, 83 times yesterday. It was like opening probably on both, but we don't know for certain on today's paper. Obviously, OI is only about 165 coming into today, so could very well be closing. That'd be a one-day trade if that was the case. Uh, the 75,000 is doing 151. Uh, those trading both days as well. So it could be a 70, 75,000 vertical. Also worth noting, 100 of the 80,000s traded this week. 50 yesterday, 50 today. So it'd be weird. 70, 75,000, 80,000. It's not really lining up like a fly, listeners. It's lining up 80 by 75 by 50. So not really fly numbers usually out there. Could be a bit of a funky ladder type trade, but... Again, we, we've seen some weird structures on the futures options in the past, but that's went up pretty much yesterday and today out there, and that's kind of leading the dance out there. Uh, the, this, whatever it is, 70, 75,000, 80,000, 175 by 150 by 100 on whatever this vertical is that's gone up last couple of days. Uh, so uh, that's kind of where a decent amount of this week's paper is going. Now, you might say, what about the micros? Well, they must be lighting it up this week if there's over 2,000 of the big futures. And unfortunately, you would be mistaken. <laughs> Only about 1,400 of the micros. I know, Dan, we talked about this before. Why do you think the micros that are aimed squarely at this retail crypto crazy audience, why do you think the micros haven't really caught fire, sir? I, I think people just really totally aren't aware of it because you're right on target there, Mark. I mean, it, the cost of entry to trade a micro compared to the big, it's... It's so more uh, palatable. It requires so much less capital. So if someone wants exposure to this market or wants to participate, or they want to find out if their trading ideas perform well, real time, well, the micros is the way to go. And I just think that the um, awareness isn't there. And, and they actually... In fairness to CME, you know, they got a lot of irons in the fire when it comes to promoting products. But I think that's one that could use a little more emphasis to bring awareness out there. Because I can't think of any other reason. Can you, Mark, why we're not seeing that explosion that you would think? I've heard some people complain about the margin. They say the margin is a little bit onerous on these. So that could certainly be weighing on them as well. I think it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. You're right. So mm -hmm. we, we talk about them. I don't hear a lot of other people talking about uh, the micros out there in CME. But if you're looking for a, a way to play crypto on the futures or futures options side and you want, you know, central clearing and all the risk, you know, the, all the risk controls that you get with a listed contract, then you could do worse than these. I know a lot of people are out there slinging their maras right now and their riots and their biddos and all that fun. They like doing it in their securities account. If you want to do it in a futures, futures options account, these are certainly here for you. I'm curious, why don't you folks trade? <laughs> Maybe we should do a poll. It's kind of hard to poll about a negative though. So if you're not trading them, you can't really answer the poll. So it's uh, it's an intriguing prospect out there. I would love to see more volume on these things. Uh, speaking of more volume, did we see more in Ether? Ether is obviously running away with it as well. All the headlines are Bitcoin, but Ether, my goodness, 3440 when we kicked off the show. We've been south of 2500 forever. I remember our buddy, Mr. Dr. Vix, famously dumped all of his Ether at 2500 a couple of years ago and has not gotten back in. We are now nearly a thousand handles north of that now. So Ether not being left behind in this mad march. Ooh, excuse me. A little bit of the sneezes there. Mad march <laughs> to the upside. Uh, 3440. And is the volume following suit? I, I, I guess 1254 on the tape. Doesn't seem like a ton to me. Again, these are the big ones. These are the 50x multipliers. So. A little bit of a question whether uh, these are going to light the world on fire. A lot of people talking now about the Bitcoin, or I should say the Ether ETF coming next. That'll be interesting to see. If we get one of those, maybe that'll light a little bit of fire in the Ether markets out there as well. Maybe this is not the most bullish thing for the listeners, though. It is the March 2,500 puts that le that's leading the dance out here in Ether. 
going up 144 times this week. Remember I said that 2,500 level, that was a very important psychological level for a long time, and clearly it still is this week. They were trading back and forth, opening the closing all week long. Uh, the net OI is only 52, so they traded 144, obviously a little bit of churn on the 2,500 puts in March this week, which is kind of interesting. Good to see a little bit of a back and forth. Looks like maybe they did a 2,500, 2,600 vertical, 80 by 50 times on Tuesday as well. It's like paper maybe taking some of that off, so... Some paper going on out here in the ETH front. Also worth noting, looks like a vertical did go up on the blocks in the uh, ETH there. Looks like it was the 4,500, 5,000 vertical. Paper bought it 25 times for $94. <laughs> so there you go. You like that one? 4,500, 5,000. So roughly 500 point vertical for $94. That's, that's quite the, it's quite the run. <laughs> for ether but then again look what it's done over the past week kind of hard to argue that it can't hit those levels it just seems like that is a quite the astronomical bit of upside for ether but then again who could put anything beyond these contracts i was checking really quickly with the micro side see if any more paper is lighting it up out there and the answer is about the same about 1300 contracts that's kind of been the the way for these micros they do the same or less than the big ones many weeks which is again not the point of these contracts. If you're looking for the action out there, it's about 300 of the 2,800 puts. So it is all puts leading the dance with Ether in March, which maybe isn't the biggest bull sign for all of you crypto fans out there, but intriguing stuff nonetheless. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dan, I know there's a segment of the audience that wishes we could spend the whole show on crypto, but uh, we have to move on. Where should we head next? So what product is, is catching your eye this week? Hmm. <laughs> Well, it seems that we have to get in some discussions about, <clears throat> excuse me, the stock indexes before we finish. So we take a peek at those. Yeah, I think we can make that happen. Listeners to the world of equities, we go. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the equities. Get into that drop down, pop out of crypto, go down two more slots to equity indexes. We're going to go to US index e mini. Uh, where we start from there is anyone's guess. We typically have gone into the e mini SP 500, but of late, the ruts and the Russell 2000 has certainly been catching a lot of people's attention as well. It is very much, as I've called it in the past, an untamed beast. It just kind of does whatever the hell it wants to do. This week is up 1.5% just since Monday, about 30 handles. At about 20 and a half when we're kicking off uh, the segment here. But Dan, what's catching your eye in the world of equities? And where do you want to go? You want to go S&P? You want to go NASDAQ? You want to go RUT? You want to go all of the above? You're the guest, sir. The floor is yours. Gosh, all of them have a story. You know something? We usually would start with the S&P, but let, let's take a peek at those Russells. I, I think it has an interesting story behind it. Are you seeing more interest in the Russell right now than you have, let's say, a year or two ago? Yes. And and just recently, if you think about it, just a month or so ago, it was floundering. The other indices were moving. And, you know, it. It what I like about it is it isn't the same as the other indices. I know it gets thrown in this category because it is a stock index, but the makeup, you know, small to mid cap companies. Interest rates have a different impact on these companies than they do on the large caps, for example. Uh, if you look at how they move, they move to a little different beat of the drum. What I find interesting about the Russell is that it can be a leader of the indexes. And, and we're not seeing exactly this type of situation, although I thought it could happen about a week ago, is that when you see the other ones not moving enthusiastically, the Russell can lead the way. So I always keep my eye on that possibility. How is it behaving? How is that segment behaving? Because oftentimes when you have an economy – that may be slowing down, if it starts to turn up, these small to mid-gap companies can be more responsive to that change. And they can tool up and get ready for it faster than some of the large cap 
So you see their earnings, you see other things that give us an idea of what's happening with this segment. So it could really lead the way. Now, what, what I find interesting, though, Mark, is what we see here now over the last couple of weeks, if you look at the Russell, it, you know, we had some big days up and then it cooled off. Another big day up and then it cooled off. Today, I thought it was going to be a screamer. And we got some more to go and the day's not done. But. We got up near that 2080, and I thought, son of a gun, if we can close up here, this implies the beginning of another leg higher. And we're not saying that. You know, it, it was hit near that 2080, and we're around 2050 right now. So we, we backed off a bit. Ideally, you don't want to see it close like this. If it does... That implies a down day for Friday. It implies uh, weakness as we go into the weekend. So what we'd want to see on Friday at a minimum, if we finish like this, an inside day, a day that just stays inside the range of Thursday, you don't want to see it creeping lower. 2037 is where you want to see this market staying above. If we break below 2037, the next stop on the train is 2020. And on the upside, if we can get a close above 2080, let's say on Monday or Tuesday, then you'd either want to see a sideways move the next day or another dramatic move to the upside. So it's a very interesting position that we're seeing so far for that market. So it's a little different than the other indices. And that's why I like keeping my eye on our friend, Mr. Russell. Let's keep that eye on all things Russell. Is it a banger week again out there in Russell 2000? Well, certainly compared to when it, what we used to talk about on the show every week a few years ago, it's quite a bit more. It's about 3x. I used to do 10 to 12,000. Now we're at about 36,000, not quite at the 50K level we were at. Uh, a few weeks ago as well. But again, respectable volume for all things Russell 2000. Again, we're at about a 20 and a half as we're kicking off this segment here. And one other thing I like about the Russell 2000, it's not all zero day all the time. If you listen to the option block, we just broke down what percentage of the major indices was all zero day. And spoiler alert, it was well over half or most of them for the SPX, it was 100%. So it's just dominated by that one day flow Rut a little bit of a different beast. Now, some of that, obviously, it's a lighter liquidity matrix, a little lighter liquidity profile. So that some of that is the reason as well. But still, it's an intriguing mix out here because we're going out nearly 15 days to the March contract. Uh, that has, again, about uh, 15 days to go. That's where 33% of the paper went up this week. So we're going to head out there. Uh, the vol in the March contract had about a 22 even, up a little over one, about 1 1.2 points on the week. So a little bit frothy, obviously, compared to VIX, which is hanging out in the low 13s, which is also what you would expect. And certainly given the movement we've seen out there of late, what's moving more, RUT or the E-mini S&P? <laughs> yeah, it's RUT. So uh, to be expected that RUT has that nice, healthy premium out there right now. It's like right or not quite nine points, about eight and a half points out there, which is uh, fairly juicy, all things considered. I know uh, some folks are talking about the RBX to VIX premium recently as well. That's also getting pretty juicy out there as well. But again, to be expected, Russell 2000 is just moving a lot more right now. And in terms of skew, not a heck of a lot to report out here, which is interesting. Uh, the puts, 3.2% bid this week, 2.2% last week. The calls, though, are where things are getting intriguing. Uh, the calls last week were pretty much flat this week. They're about a half a percent cheap, which you may say, what's the big deal? But again, this is a major equity index, listeners. And the calls are effectively flat. That shows you there is a lot of upside buying going on out here in the Russell 2000. You see that in the near day to contracts as well. Uh, the contracts going out in one day and four days, the calls are, are both bid in both of those expirations right now. Half a percent in one day and about a tenth of a percent in four days. So any positive call skew in an equity, a major equity index is a big deal. And so seeing that, and we have seen that for a few weeks now in the Russell 2000. Kind of backs up Dan's point about how there's just, shall we say, some enthusiasm 
out there in the Russell 2000 right now. Uh, what is leading the dance this week? It is the 15 day to go, 21 half calls. The 2150 calls exactly 100 points out of the money right now. So these are these are pretty bonkers calls. Can we get there in 15 days? Hey, anything is possible these days. Uh, they went up about 2,380 times this week. Almost all of that on Monday. 1,916 on Monday. 411 on Tuesday. A whopping 53 yesterday and a goose egg today. Uh, all that opening earlier in the week. So people opening for size on the 21 halves. Worth noting the 20 halves, which is a strike you might more reasonably expect because it is the at the money strike right now they went up about 470 times on monday also opening though so no rolling action there if anything they're just opening that 20 half 21 half vertical doing it almost on a one by four ratio <laughs> that was the case uh interesting interesting stuff out there and then behind that again the 20 halves trading pretty actively this week about 500 on Monday, 700 and change on Tuesday, 100 yesterday, 250 today, again, against OI of about 1,800. So uh, the volume on each, the OI on each, about 3,500 on the 21 halves right now, and the OI on the 20 halves, 1,800. So roughly two to one. So that could back up one of those kind of ratio verticals we were talking about. I don't know. You like that, listeners? A 20 half, 21 half ratio vertical in in the russell 2000 with about 15 days to go hopefully you got something else if you're going to be short those units hopefully you got something else in your back pocket again so you're probably got a little bit of of rut burning a, a hole in your back pocket if that's the case if you're going to do that otherwise you're just uh, net short units in a name that's shown to be explosive so good luck with that not all calls all the time though 2000 puts which again this is a Pivotal psychological level, the 2000 level on the Russell 2000. They went up about 1,300 times this week. Uh, the big day yesterday, 750 or so, mostly closing. So it seems like folks on this rally taking the opportunity to get the heck out of Dodge on those puts. About 500 on Tuesday, slightly opening there. So it could be some back and forth trading between Tuesday and Wednesday out there. Not much to speak of on Monday or today. Uh, the OI is about 750 right now. So it seems like uh, there still is a decent chunk open on the 2000 strike. So intriguing stuff. Of course, it's not all 15 days to go. There is some near-dated flow as well. we got the 2100 calls expiring tomorrow, going up 1,100 times this week. So again, those are 50 handles out of the money right now. Let's see what paper was up to out there uh, this week, listeners. Were they buying? Were they selling? Let's see. Were they opening? Were they closing? Looks like they were mostly closing throughout the week, which again, we're... A bit of a ways away. It looks like the 20 half, 2100 vertical went up about 630 times on Monday, uh, mostly closing there. So somebody bailed on this vertical on Monday, and that was kind of the big trade. Then we have 400 and change of the 2100s going up today. The OI is only 390, so somebody is opening on the 2100s expiring tomorrow, about 400 times today. Overriding them? Probably, but how much are you getting for those? <laughs> I'll have to dig in to see. Uh, right now, gun to your head, listeners. 2100s expiring tomorrow in the rut. You buying or are you selling? I don't see any other verticals really against it. Unless 327 of the 2090s have gone up today as well. So you like that? $10 ratio vertical? Nah, not my favorite thing out there, but uh, intriguing paper nonetheless, Mr. Dan. We could spend the rest of the show in equities as well. But we got time for probably one more complex, Mr. Dan, or we can get out to a little bit of uh, listener listener feedback. What do you want to do, sir? Gosh, that's a tough choice. The well, Do you want to go to a different complex? Should we do that? If you want I to, mean, what's floating your boat, you want... sir? You are the guest. I will let you choose. <laughs> right. Well, let's see. Shall we take – how about looking at a market that has a lot of pent-up uh, anxiety, I would say, a market that wants to go higher but just hasn't got the job done, and I don't think the fundamentals support it. And that's our friend, Mr. Crude. All right, how about crude oil? All right, to energy we go. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, welcome to Energy, and let the record show. I thought this was a week we maybe would slip by without any energy making it onto the show, but let the record show it was Dan who invoked the energy, not me, so 
<laughs> don't get mad at me if you're one of these people saying, all you do is talk about energy. Uh, we don't talk about crude oil that often. So that this is a new one to kind of make it on the show. I haven't chatted about crude in a little bit out there. Notice no nat gas this week, listeners. So there you go. Nat gas, a rear respite week out there for nat gas. But uh, crude oil hanging out right at about a 78 right now. 77.99, up about one and a half points on the week or nearly 2%. I didn't see it in our vol or our underlying movers and shakers, but that doesn't mean it is not rocking and rolling out there. So I'm trying to look and see if I could find it. But yeah, if, if you expanded our top 10 movers and shakers listeners, we went down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way down to number 12. We would find WTI this week up about a third of a percent. So there you go, Mr. Dancer. You have requested crude oil the floor is yours so what's catching your eye out there this week well what i find interesting about it is that the prevailing feelings is that this thing should be taking off i mean we think about all the unrest in the world and you know you mentioned that gas it comes into this too we think about what's happening in the red sea and we think about what's happening globally just geopolitically and it would seem that uncertainty would just drive this market higher. If we look at the dollar, you know, there's it trades in dollars. So the dollar has an impact here too. If the dollar's very strong, well, then it has a tendency to dampen crude oil prices. It's one of the factors that can come into play. So I find that kind of interesting. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing a market where $79 is just the magic number. We haven't been above that since November of last year. And then I think, well, should we? Fundamentally, we have that uncertainty out there. But this is a market that really is also driven by supply and demand. All right. Well, is supply an issue? Not in the United States. And if you look at it from a broader point of view, there are three countries that can produce over 10 million barrels a day. The United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. And those two countries are under its maximum. Saudi Arabia is near 13 million barrels a day. We can produce near 13 million barrels a day as well. And we're, we're not far off from that. We consume around 21 million barrels a day. The world produces a little over 100 million barrels a day. So the United States uses about 20 to 25 percent of that global big barrel of oil of 100 million barrels a day. If we think about that other seven or eight million that we need to consume every day, we get it in two places. The first place is we buy the most crude from our friends in Canada. The second place is Mexico. But when you look at those countries, the Canadian crude that comes into our country is typically heavy tar sands crude, which takes a lot of processing. We have the capability in the Gulf Coast to do that. For our, our friends in Mexico, they have heavy sour crude, and they, they had, don't have the capabilities like we do to refine it. So we'll buy it from them, bring it into Texas or Louisiana, refine it, and sell the refinished products back to those countries. So, hmm, that's not out of whack right now. In fact, we're seeing some drilling rigs for nat gas and for crude kind of slowing down a bit. In other words, the number of rigs that are being used is one of the barometers that people look at. Well, then how about the global situation supply wise well you know mark it seems like that has kind of calmed down for crude and that gas it, if you look at europe you know germany when this whole thing started with russia they had no import facilities so you couldn't bring that gas to them at that point of uh, lng you couldn't bring that to them 
And if you look at some of the stable supplies they've had, the compatriots in Norway, they're still providing about 20% of uh, nat gas uh, and other energy products to Europe. So the situation there has kind of calmed down. Well, then what about other people who consume uh, oil? Well, India, China, they consume a lot of oil, and they're buying a lot from Russia. So Russia may not be selling it to uh, Europe, but they're still selling it. Less, but they're still selling crude oil. And just like with steel, when we have tariffs on steel from China, China sends it to Vietnam. They take the steel, they stamp Vietnam on it, and it comes out and, and people can buy and sell from uh, or buy from Vietnam. Same thing happens with crude oil. It can go to another country, and from that country, it can be sold into the marketplace. So, yes, there are restrictions, but... All these countries always dance around it. And if you're India and somebody comes to you and say, hey, you know something? I'll sell you my crude for $30 off the market price. And that's what they're doing. So if you're India and you need crude, how do you turn it down? So they are buying it. And they're willing to make transactions not in U.S. dollars. And that makes Russia very happy. It makes China very happy. They don't like the U.S. dollar and they don't want to use the doggone stuff because the United States can grab onto that, those assets, if it's in dollars. So we're seeing kind of a balanced situation globally when it comes to crude. And that's what I meant, that a market that wants to go higher it doesn't seem like they're the fundamental drivers that we need to see. It, it, the $79 to $76, we've been in there for a few weeks now in that range. And it's kind of fairly valued. I don't, some people are saying it should be at 100. I don't see that fundamentally, us getting to that range. Maybe we kiss 80 to $84, but I could see us at $74 too. So I, I think it's a fascinating market fundamentally and then also price action wise technically. So it's one to I think keep the eye on. I, I can't wait. And it's one of the reasons why I picked it. I want you to talk about it, Mark. Give us some insights in terms of what does it look like how people are positioning themselves on the option side. Well, let us find out, shall we? Right now, like I said, right about 78 in that front future there, listeners. Uh, is it a banger week from a volume perspective? Not really. We usually spec 400, 450 this time of the show at 371 right now. So actually a little bit light on the volume front out here in WTI this week. And most of that, 44.4% going up. Forget your zero day, listeners, going up in the contract that's expiring in about 15 days, the April contract right now. What is the volume you might be asking in April WTI? A little bit shy of 30, about 29 and a third, kind of unched on the week. So again, uh, outside of nat gas, uh, that's really the most volatile energy asset, obviously. WTI respectable, a 29, but it's not blowing the doors off the way nat gas and indeed crypto are right now. In terms of skew, not a huge evolution this week. Almost 7% bid with the puts last week, 6.7%. This week, 5.4%. So still bid, but coming in a little bit. Uh, the calls last week, 4.7% cheap. This week, a little bit cheaper, about 5.2% cheap. So you see a modest equity skew pricing in there in the WTI options. And what's leading the dance? I said we're at about a 78 right now. You might be thinking 80s, maybe 75 puts. Nope, it's the 70 puts going away in 15 days. That is leading the dance with about 16,000 contracts this week. Again, that's also reflecting kind of a light week when only 16,000 is enough to take the top spot. A pretty active week outside of Monday, though. Almost 5,000 going up today against OI of about 19,000. 6,400 yesterday, mostly opening about 4,000 on Tuesday. Uh, less than a thousand on Monday, slightly closing there. So a lot of back and forth on the seventy put strike, which again is interesting as we continue to modestly climb a little bit out here. Not really threatening the seventy handle right now, but uh, a lot of people playing here on the seventy puts. Right behind it, we have the seventy five puts. So 
You want a little bit tighter protection? There you go. About 13,000 of these going up this week. The big day for these was actually Tuesday. About 5,000 going up on Tuesday. Looks like about, and about 4,000 of the 70 puts went up the same day. So could be some vertical action there, even though it's not really lining up one to one. Uh, then today, obviously, looks like we have some relevant paper as well. About 4,900 of the 70 puts versus 4,600, I should say, of the 75 puts. So probably some vertical action out here as well. Uh, again, it's about almost 11,000 open of the 75 puts right now, so hard to tell what today's paper is up to. The rest of the week kind of light, 1,600 on Wednesday, 1,700 on Monday. Back and forth opening to closing there. So maybe we have some people rolling up some of their protection there from the 70 strike, even though they were both opening on Tuesday. So could have been just straight opening, 70, 75 put verticals out there as well. Uh, not to be outdone, there are some calls to be found. I thought this strike might be a little bit more active, given the fact that we're threatening it right now. It's the 80 strike. Uh, the 80 calls doing about 9,000 contracts this week. Uh, the big day for those, actually kind of almost exactly tied, which is weird, about 2,800 each for Tuesday and Wednesday. Mostly closing there, so some folks, I guess, as we rallied slightly toward the 80 strike, decided to get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, about Again, about 2,800 each, and then about 1,700 today, 1,500 on Monday. This is all against OI today of about 12,700, so it's like some folks as we got towards the 80 strike, got the heck out of Dodge. Maybe some of them rolling up to the 83s. The 83s were opening about 5,500 times this week, so could be some of that action going on as well. Let's look around really quickly before we get out of here for this week uh, to see if any other interesting and or aberrant paper. And if we go a little bit farther out, we go to the May 70 puts. Those went up about 6,200 times this week as well. Again, mostly opening, including 3,300 on Monday and about 1,400 today against OI of 8,600. So a lot of opening on the 70 puts in May. I could certainly see that. People were talking about a lot of downside not too long ago in WTI. Give yourself a little bit more room to run. Give yourself about 50 days. I could see some folks expressing an interest there on the 70 puts. All right, that music means we've come to the end. But speaking of expressing an interest really quickly here, didn't have much time for a futures options feedback this week. A lot of good stuff to get to. But of course, uh, you folks having a lot of fun out there in the live chat. A lot of you debating what's going on with going on with what's going on with the the cme crypto products we have a lot of folks nickel saying he thinks it's the margin that's hurting those yeah i've certainly heard that others like uh, age delacuere says he thinks it's just because it's a lot easier for the average retail customer to trade the actual crypto or else the etfs or substitutes like mara or riot rather than opening a futures account well yeah there certainly is clearly some interest in those as well right now that just there isn't the extra step you're right of having to deal with the future a lot of folks clearly content with the insane amount of vol they're getting in mara right now 141 percent something along those lines so now that's just a, a bonkers one a lot of folks also like it when you come on the show dan a lot of people chiming in saying they're enjoying the uh, these dan palooza episodes uh options queen saying dan is the man love when he's on the show it's a dan palooza this week and then uh option god has an interesting suggestion he says we need a twifo episode with dan and one of our other guests carly garner uh debating he said that would be awesome i'm not sure if you two would debate you both seem very, very similar, very nice people. I don't think you'd see. I don't think you'd be getting in each other's face about nat gas or anything. But uh, nonetheless, they want to see it. Dan, what do you think? Well, I'd be happy to do that with Carly. She's terrific, and I've enjoyed that. And I also want to thank Option Queens for her kind comments. That's that's very nice. She thank is you. a good one. She's the queen for a reason. She is, Mr. Dan. But that music means we have come to the end of another epic journey through the world of futures options. And while I'm planning your heated debates with Carly, two of you just throwing bitch out to keep you separated virtually. It'll be like two rabid dogs going at it, Dan. <laughs> but while we're planning that, <laughs> it'll be the nicest debate in the history of... I don't know what, what they would even debate. Why are they debating? Why can't they just discuss things politely? But I don't know. Our well, audience wants fun. a debate. If it, that's what makes a market. <laughs> it'll be like the old McLaughlin right. group. People not agreeing. Yes. That's what gives that a point of view. Yes, yes. In the meantime, Dan, if folks want more of your point of view, where should they go? What should they do? Well, I have a website, dangramsa.com. And if you haven't traded futures before, one place to start is just to watch them. 
and there are three things on this the site. Uh, it, there's a free video, lasts a few minutes, and it takes a few of the 22 markets that I cover in an advanced video, which is about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, we look at the fundamentals and the price action in a variety of markets, so stock indexes, currencies, interest rates, metals, uh, energy, and agricultural markets. Uh, it, it's a way to get a feel for what's going on. You'll see red and green lines, which imply buy and sell signals. I'm not making buy and sell recommendations, but I do want to share my point of view, and that's all it is. Uh, you can go back over 10 years and look at this published every day. So you can go back and say, all right, what was he showing when this happened? Uh, so you can go back in those videos and you'll see how those red and green lines change uh, over time as well. So just, uh, oh, I guess it's dangramsit.com. I guess I should say what it is, but uh, so it, it's another spot. And if you have any questions, you can just go to the thing tab where it says contact and an email will be sent to me. There you go. Dan Gramza, G-R-A-M-Z-A dot com is the place to go to check out all of his great videos and analysis in between his appearances on this program. Dan, we got to get you on the old Twitter as well so we could mention you during the during the show here. What do you think? Sure, that'd be great. There you go. We'll get Dan on the old Twitter slash X there as well. But if you're even remotely intrigued by these markets, listeners, you owe it to yourselves to check out Dan's great content. We really just scratched the surface of it here on this show. In the meantime, you can scratch the surface of some TWIFO reports for yourselves. Simigroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, is the place to go. And if you want the full kit and caboodle, the full enchilada of the Bantix reports, if you will, including a lot of other great tools, you want the Seaball tool, you want pace of the roll, block trades, all that stuff, and a whole metric ton more we don't have time to get to on the show every week. Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com, the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Tell Nick we sent you. He will be quite happy to hear from you. That's going to do it for us on the network today. But don't worry, back again tomorrow for a little bit of Vol action. The pit crew is away. Who will join me as some sweet special guests on Vol Views? Well, you got to tune in tomorrow to find out. Should be a fun one. And then after that, for a little bit of options oddities exclusively for you pro folks, who's going to join me there? I guess you got to tune in to find out. Should be a fun time for all. If you want to join us on Options Oddities or join us live, have some fun during the shows here, listeners, or get your name in the hat for the February slash Leap Day Pro Trading Crate, <laughs> head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Love to see you there. Back again tomorrow and then back again next week. Another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. 
That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 